Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to uh, today's SAG AFTRA Foundation special screening. What did you think of Danger One? <laughs> Loved it, right? <laughs> <clears throat> So please welcome the director of Danger One, Tom Osh. And please welcome film stars, James Jurdy. And Tom Everett Scott. Well, you know, talk about a fusion of genres. Uh, <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a ton of fun. Tom, how did this uh, come about for your directorial debut for a feature film? Um, well, <laughs> it's, it's a combination of things. Um, we, we started writing the script probably like, probably like, Two years after, like th this whole thing was born out of the. Um, it's a product of the, the the Great Recession, actually. That's the, that's what got this whole thing started, and I think we, at the by the time we started writing the script, the recession had officially been over for two years, but at that point we were still reading a lot about just like how a lot of people out there, you know, were just the aftermath of it, and like how people were still uh, there was a lot of hardship. People were angry at at that having been allowed to happen in the first place. And um, we were angry too, even though it didn't really directly affect us, you know, uh, the way it did um, other people. So we kind of channeled that into that, which is we wanted to, we thought it'd be a fun idea to make a movie. It's almost like a bit like a revenge picture where like these working men and working women, like the little guys, uh, you know, they, they're, they're fed up and they decide to, um, to hit back at the people that let this happen. Like there was a bit of a, seeing them steal money from a corrupt one percenter who doesn't want to pay taxes just felt kind of cathartic at that point. Mm -hmm. um, the whole paramedic thing, um, so my dad, uh, before he retired, he was a doctor in, in Switzerland, which is where I'm from. So he uh, worked in a hospital, eventually he opened his own private practice, which was attached to our house. So like. I grew up in this world. Also, he met my mom, who was a nurse in the hospital. So that was just like, you know, you've, you've got that on your mind. Um, and then, yeah, basically, I had pitched a whole bunch of stuff. And every new pitch was a little smaller. So uh, over winter break of 2015, I think, I sat down on my couch. And I'm like, OK, what would be a, a, a catchy hook for just the most contained thing I can think of? And like just ideally just one location, you know, and that was this. And the first treatment actually, pretty much the whole thing took place inside the ambulance. Once uh, Stefan, the writer, came on board, obviously it got a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he opened it up. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, and uh, you know, we cranked this out in a, in a few months and um, I shot a sizzle for it. And um, after a little while, uh, James and, uh, you know, uh, a whole bunch of other producers came on board and it happened pretty quick at that point. Yeah, you know, James, what's your what's your take on the like sort of fusion of uh, of this movie? You know, it's a uh, it's dark. It definitely embraces its R rating, <laughs> pretty quick. And uh, but it's also like this this great like yin and yang thing yeah. that you guys go. Like, you want the money, and you you got a conscience. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think what drew so many of us to this project is that it was an action film, but it wasn't just an action film. There was a morality tale element to it. There was a buddy comedy element to it. And it's the kind of film that we hope, you know, the audience leaves asking, what would you do if you were in that situation? What would you do if you were in these people's shoes? And that made it so much more human to us because we weren't just doing a shoot, em, shoot em up kind of movie. We weren't doing a movie about unrealistic circumstances. You know, like Tom said, it was something that could happen and we got the chance to just embellish it and have a lot more fun with it. Well, since you asked, Tom, yes. what would you do? <laughs> oh, what would I do with the money? <laughs> yeah. If I was Dean? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, personally? Yeah, sure. Me? <laughs> oh my gosh, let me think. Sure. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, the guy died, right? Yeah. I mean, he was dead. I, I tried mean, to save him, right? Tried yeah. to save him. I don't know. I guess 
Oh, I'd turn the money in, of course. That's oh, what you're sure. supposed to do. <laughs> you're supposed to turn it in. I would do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but you're, you're, you know, playing playing someone who's uh, who, who doesn't have a conscience, being a little more selfish about it, and, and especially again with the tone of the film being like a but real super dark comedy. Like, how fun was it to play a character like that? I think that um, it was super fun, and when I read it, I couldn't believe I was going to get the opportunity to play such a fun character. I usually don't get those opportunities to be that guy. And the writing was so great uh, for this character and, and the voice of this guy. I really started to like really see it and I knew what I wanted to do. And so uh, I was really excited. It was like really getting this gift, this character, you know, to, to unleash things, you know, that I mean were probably stored inside my brain somewhere. And uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, you, you talk about how you, you opened up the film and it and became like I mean I, I I not just because I live here but I do love movies that really sort of depict L A as a character in the film and this definitely does completely different from another film about L A that you did that also depicted L A as a character but uh, what what kind, what were you trying to capture about L A the night the, you know the the nocturnal L A. Uh, we actually, because L.A. has, in movies, it has a very specific look and sound, and we actually try to get away from that as far as we can and just kind of <laughs> give it its own spin. That's why we shot in Vernon. Like, a lot of people who see this movie, they have no idea where that's even at. Um, and even, like, down to, like, the, 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 the music, the score, like, when we talked to the composer, um, it was very much about, like, get away from the L.A. sound, the way L.A. sounds in television shows and in, in, in other movies. And like he just kind of went crazy with like this mix of like 90s hip hop uh, slash chipsy mix. Um, and, and it just kind of, it makes the whole thing seem a, a little alien and a little bit more nightmarish. And actually when you listen to it or even watch the movie, like it gets, L.A. starts to look more and more like a living hell. You know, the colors and the music. Which it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just... <laughs> Um, you know, did you did you like uh, go like ride along with the paramedics and stuff like that? Yeah, no, I actually had the opportunity to do that, and it was extremely edifying because you know these guys are, are real life heroes, and they jump into situations without any protection, without any artillery, without any kind of defense, and sometimes it can be as silly as you know helping an old lady get a cat out of a tree or just doing something really minor, but sometimes they get into really dangerous stuff. What was the most dangerous thing you saw on oh, your okay. uh, um, Fortunately, I wasn't on the dangerous ride. I picked the really non-dangerous <laughs> ride. Right. I was like, take me on the ride where the old ladies need help going up the stairs or stuff like that. But no, I mean, we did witness like a couple of traffic accidents and biking accidents over the course of the time that I spent with them. And, you know, you just kind of learn about the kind of... Uh, uh, almost tragic comic nature of that business, you know, because there's uh, there's comedy in it because you're seeing all kinds of humans in extremely strange and difficult situations. But there's uh, sometimes it can be life or death, and uh, it's really the case. Do you, do you think that sort of gives gives you like more because you you did find sort of comedy, mm -hmm. uh, if you can even call it that, in these in these sort of situations? Do you think that sort of like gave you like a, a jumping off point to like really just like hey, you know, I'm playing, a, I'm a paramedic, I'm playing a paramedic, you know, these guys get paid, like, the, the slow salary for, for what they're doing, putting their lives on the line, and just really, like, go for it, especially you, because your character's so dark. Uh, I had done research for other uh, projects, like riding along with uh, LAPD or riding along with, with paramedics, and I always f found that they were the salt of the earth, that only truly good people do those jobs, because that is the most difficult. They are really hard jobs that I'm just so glad that people are willing to do. Um, the only guy that we actually try to save is the first guy, so we only are like <laughs> <laughs> applying our... Dude. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're yeah. only applying our skills in that right. sense right. to the, for the Otherwise, first guy. We were just kind of letting fate have their way with everybody, you know. <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, do you um, uh, in, in terms of the uh, going for multiple takes? Uh, do you encourage like uh, improv and you know when you, your actors and stuff like that, Tom? Uh, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, so, I mean especially with Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did we did a lot of that. Um, I mean, it kind of depends on the day. On certain days, you're just trying to just have to get it done. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun to let Tom off the leash. <laughs> what was, what was a, a good example of a, of a scene that you were doing where you took something that was scripted and you went off the leash, so to speak? Um, we didn't really, like, um, 
improvise dialogue that much, I wouldn't say. I say the, the, the monologues for Dean were there. You know, there was, there was a, quite a bit to sink my teeth into on the page. Yeah, and actually, I think yeah, maybe like Dennis O'Hare and Michael O'Neill might have done a lot. Uh, might have done a little bit more than that. Um, especially Michael O'Neill. I mean, he would like right before we'd shoot, he would he would just write his you know add another third to a scene that he wrote himself, and we you know we'd shoot it. But uh, so yeah, you're right. Maybe it was because Stefan had already the writer had already you know made Dean so verbose. You know, I mean, there was just like a lot that he was spewing out, like the basketball, the scene where we're just shooting around the basketball mm -hmm. and yeah. stuff. I mean, there was just so much there for me already. Yeah, I was just adding just kind of that I, Dean flair, I guess. I, I, the whole, the I whole, the whole hot tub thing. I mean, yeah. that's, that wasn't in the script for sure. I think it was a, ni a nice balance <laughs> well, I guess of, there was some stuff of what was said <laughs> and what was not said at the same time because a, a lot of the, the chemistry between our characters was that he was the talkative one, he was the extroverted one, he was the one that was loud, and my eye guy had to be very quiet and very observational. So we, we worked on saying stuff and not saying stuff at the same time. And because of the budget, we didn't always have time to get, you know what I mean, you're you're limited on the number of takes you can do. And so you are trying to cram it in. And there were these moments where we really tried to preserve, you know, uh, the, you know the, the essence of these scenes. Like there's the scene where I'm talking about um, buying a new ambulance. Mm -hmm. And I was really, I mean, I'm glad that we had our time with that one because I feel like that was an important scene for, for my character. Well, because it was a long scene, and because like he in the middle of it, he does this, uh, just a shit ton of cocaine, and so like your whole approach <laughs> to that scene just switches halfway through with the energy, you know, tripling. How, how fast was the shoot? How how many days production? I think it was only twenty three days. Wow, that's pretty fast. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> how do how do you like doing uh, working at that speed versus maybe doing something that's a, a much more bigger budget studio film where the craft services for that type of movie is more than the budget for this film, probably. Uh, I can't really talk about the craft service, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, those people, they work hard. Um, uh, I think that it's more important on a shorter budget and a shorter schedule to really put in your work ahead of time to make sure, like with Dean, I really wanted to um, make sure that the arc that he was following, I was really paying attention to it. Um, where he would go, where he would come break down, where he would lose his confidence, where he would have his confidence. You know, I just wanted to make sure that we were nailing that on the timeline of the of the movie because we were shooting out a sequence, which we did a lot of that. We paid a lot of close attention to that. Yeah, and I, I remember because uh, Tom actually only came on board like it was 48 hours before we started shooting. Mm -hmm. So we only met two days, the night, the Saturday before the Monday we started. And I remember I was worried about like, oh my God, like you have no time to prep. So I went into the, like this first meeting with you just having a million things to say. And this guy just walked in. I, I, d I don't think I spoke at all at that meeting. He just was so prepared. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is how I see it. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, like, <laughs> we, <laughs> we were working on it for some time before, you know, just kind of getting to the base of the character and just trying to understand how we were going to make it, you know, action driven but drama driven at the same time. And then when Tom came on board, I remember, you know, we were all just trying to figure out how, whether we were going to play it for laughs or whether this was going to be kind of a more serious kind of action film. And you never really know the chemistry that you're going to develop with a working actor or with your working partner. And then immediately from the moment that you know, we started playing with the lines, we knew that we were going to go lighter and just have a lot of fun with it. And that relationship with, I'm sorry, uh, the, the other actor, Damon, who was um, the, the fireman, you know, those scenes were really important because that was the beginning of the movie. And you really want to understand where these guys were, what, what history I had had with Damon's character, and he didn't know him, you know what I mean? Because that was a real struggle for power between those guys. Yeah. yeah, we were just trying to establish all the dynamics as as quickly as possible in order to get to them finding the money. Well, well, you know, it's interesting. The that tone, that chemistry that you guys have is it's it's like right it's there right at the very very beginning. And that's like, okay, I'm in. Like I could feel that this was like like again, like the tone just had me at the very beginning and, and you maintain the tone like all the way through the like, you like say you shut out a sequence, but so you you came in like two days before shooting. No, now you say that I don't. That sounds short to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we met at the Roosevelt Hotel Saturday know, night. Yeah. Monday you were on set and we did the basketball thing. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. Well, it, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Things move quickly sometimes, and, and um, 
It's tr- that's true. You're right. I actually like it to be condensed like that because then I really like bust my ass in a short amount of time. If I have more time to do stuff, I'll procrastinate. But, but the, so so that's isn't it true? Don't we all procrastinate yeah. when we have more time? Yeah, that's absolutely true of like every profession. Um, you know, I want to ask like, what made you want to become an actor? Uh, well, I grew up here in L.A., kind of just watching movies. I would just go to the movies with my friends and with my parents and just I would see everything that was out there and that's where I fell in love with acting, I fell in love with movie making, I fell in love with storytelling and to me an actor was just kind of like a, an avatar into this, into this other world that you were being transported to. And um, you know, I remember seeing films you know, with some of my friends who are here at the audience and my, my parents you know, after school and stuff like that. It's like I want to I do that one day. I want to make someone feel the way that I felt while I was growing up. Was there any was there any one performance, any one movie yeah, that just there like was? I still remember it was Midnight Run. Remember that movie? Midnight Run. That was still one of my all time favorites because I, I think it was the first time I actually went to a theater. 1988. And, and, and the dynamic between De Niro and Charles Grodin in that film was, was something that we were trying to a little bit emulate with the kind of buddy comedy where they you know one guy's straight guy and the other guy's a little off the hinge. So, I mean, that's one that stayed with me. That is a great movie. Yeah. I was thinking Michael Keaton and Night Shift with uh, yeah. Henry Winkler yeah, for this movie. That was good. That was good, too. Um, my, uh, the first time I ever wanted to be an actor, I didn't know I ever wanted to be one until I saw my older sister. Uh, she had two lines in South Pacific in the high school play. and She was a freshman, and uh, I was in fifth grade. And I watched her. I was so excited to see her in a play, even though I didn't really know what one was, really. And when she came on and did her line, and then she ran off, she was one of the nurses, and I thought, she blew it. She was terrible. <laughs> I, I could do that so much better. <laughs> and it really was like the impetus. And I like memorized her script. And then the next night, I went and I watched her play, and I, I knew all the lines. And I was like saying a line. I mean, I was just like crazy. Uh, and ever, ever since that happened, I basically tried to be, you know, an actor every single time. Wow, yeah. By the way, kudos to Night Shift. I love that movie. Yeah, 1982, Ron Howard. Ron Howard, if you've never seen it, it's awesome. Feed mayonnaise to the tuna. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, see the movie. You'll know. It's so true. You know, <laughs> those ideas. He really was like one of my inspirations. For this. Michael Keaton, totally, yeah. yeah. Um, what the, how did you get your psych heart? At the, uh, <laughs> it was funny. At the time that uh, I got out of uh, university, it was a tough time because uh, the writer's strike was happening, if you remember that, and, and there wasn't, it wasn't a lot of opportunity. And um, all my friends who were in acting class at the time were all getting into uh, television, daytime television. So I had a friend of mine refer me to uh, The Bold and the Beautiful. Remember The Bold? Uh, still, sure, yeah. still on. And um, I just became uh, an extra on that show. <laughs> I mean, I just did background work on it. And at the time, I think the term was uh, Taft Hartlead. Yep. You have to get Taft Hartlead in order to get a certain amount of lines that would allow you to be in the union. Because if you weren't in SAG, you couldn't get a job, you couldn't make a film, you couldn't do anything, you couldn't qualify. It was like you were an infidel, yep. you know? So I, I, uh, I just stayed, you know, doing little bit parts and little tiny things on, on a lot of daytime series and on various independent stuff until I finally had enough lines that I could present to SAG. So they say, all right, you said a line here, you said a line there, you walked on here, you did that, all right, here's your card. It took like a year and a half. It was, it was ultimate con- I mean, conundrum, isn't I it? I mean, it, it took a while. I was just doing little things for, for a long time. But when I got the card, that was it. That was like, you know, passage to another world. That was fun. How about you, Tom? Uh, the first time I ever got paid as an actor was a McDonald's commercial. I played a guy who was asking his boss for practicing, asking his boss for a raise with his coworker at like the McDonald's, and like I remember just gesturing with the fry. They really wanted me to do that. It was important. <laughs> and then they wanted me to take a bite of the fry at the end of the thing. And they were like, "There's a spit bucket right in here," and I was like, "No, I love fries," and I ate them all, and I ate a thousand fries that day. <laughs> Uh, but that's how I got my card. <laughs> yeah, McDonald's fries are the best. What's your favorite movie of all time? Uh, Jurassic Park. Yeah. Jurassic Park? Yeah. Really? I, in, in terms of like popcorn cinema, that's that's that's. I walked out of that when I was 13, and I went home and grabbed my dad's little video camera and made my first short. That was the beginning of. If it wasn't for that movie, that if, if my mom hadn't taken me to that Saturday afternoon screening in Switzerland, I would have never. We, I don't think we would be sitting here right now. So I'd love that you immediately knew. You didn't have to even think about it. Because I tell How everyone about, about that. Well, <laughs> we're talking, Midnight Run's a sentimental favorite, but the one that I've seen probably more than any other film in the world is The Godfather. I still worship The Godfather. That is still just the gold standard for me. 
That's just, you know, I learned everything, almost everything I know from The Godfather. <laughs> that's, that, cool. that's a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? I, I, don't, um, I don't think I have a favorite movie. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I was like several. Like, I, I don't know. There's so many. So many good ones. Give me, give me three. Three uh, of your favorites. Three of my favorites? God damn it. That thing you do. <laughs> no, that's not one of my favorites. I hate that movie. So no. no, I love that movie. I love that movie. Um, it's a great movie. I think like my the first like real crazy cinematic experience for me was uh was probably Star Wars because I was seven and I was just like wow I was blown away by by the movie and stuff so I had like all the action figures and I was really into it um, but I don't know I I mean there's so many good movies Jurassic Park is great that's such a it look you can watch that movie now and be like that's better than sci -fi. yeah all the other Jurassic Parks as well <laughs> clearly but I mean like the effects in that movie were incredible like the the chase scene with the Tyrannosaurus Rex it's it's unbelievable yeah. I like that movie a lot I don't know I like Close Encounters I like yeah I like Goodfellas and Godfather and all those guy movies and girl movies and um I don't know man so that's a tough question why are you asking the tough questions what, <laughs> what ask me where I got my after card uh, what, what is the uh, all right here's here's one here what's the best advice an actor, actress, director, filmmaker ever gave you? Like something uh, that stayed with you? Uh, that's Tom Hanks, because it was uh, the first time I had done a big movie, and uh, I was obviously like freaking out, and he said, um, he said a lot of things that were memorable and have st stayed with me. He said, uh, you think, you, he said, less is more, but let me give you a little more explanation to just less is more. He said, you think you're not interesting. You think you need to be more interesting you are interesting. And, you know, he stood on my mark for my first close-up, and he said, go look, go look at me through the lens. And I looked through the camera lens at him, and he looked right down the barrel at me from my mark, and it was like, you know, it was that. And I was like, oh my God. Like, the, he said, yes, that's right, Tom. This is gonna be 40 feet wide and luminous. Your nostrils are gonna be as big as Buick's. And he said, and just remember that every little thing you do is just going to be magnified. So, I mean, that was just such great film acting, like, lesson, you know. It's a great film. September of 96. Um, <laughs> I actually had the uh, distinct privilege of working with the late, great Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds. Yeah, uh, on my last film. Uh, that was um, one of his last films now. And I, I remember forever the uh, first time that I met him because it was film I also wrote. And he said, so you're, uh, you know, creating your own opportunities, son. And I said, uh, well, you know, try. I'm just, you know, honored to be in your presence. And then he, he went on to tell me uh, a story about how he, uh, was, I guess MGM at the time wanted him to be Rocky. They wanted him to play Rocky. And uh, Sylvester Stallone had written Rocky. And uh, no one wanted Stallone in the film at that time. But Stallone would not give up the script unless he was in it. He was Rocky. No one was ever going to play Rocky but Stallone. Right. So uh, he went on to tell me that story, and then he said, you know, Stallone created his own opportunities. Create your own opportunities. So I'll never forget what Bert said. Smart. That's, uh, that's very smart. Yeah. Create your own opportunities. Like, just like you did with uh, creating, uh, directing this movie. But what is uh, the best advice you ever got? It actually happened on this movie. I, I forgot what his position was on the crew, but he said, bring an extra pair of shoes to the set. Um, and I thought it was really silly. But um, he's like, halfway through the day, when you're all tired, just take those shoes out of the back, put them on, fresh pair of socks, maybe two, and you will feel like it's, it's like you're just fresh again. I thought it was very silly, but I, I tried it one day, and uh, it works. <laughs> uh, um, Craft service guy? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Raph? Was that him? Oh, yeah. That's right. Wow. Yeah, no, I remember yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we take questions from SAG After Foundation members. And uh, this question is from Larry. Hi, Larry. How are you? Uh, this is for you, Tom. Okay. So in the theater company you formed at the beginning of your career, uh, did you specialize in any types of plays? Okay, so when we first started our theater company in New York back in 1993, um, I remember we liked doing like Sam Shepard plays and, uh, you know, those kind of things. And, and then we decided to stop like... Um, doing somebody else's plays and come up with original stuff. And so we, we put out like uh, to, to playwrights in New York, you know, please send us your one acts and we want to originate, you know, we want to do original works here. Because we didn't want to be a cover band, we would always say. We want to <laughs> originate plays. Um, but it was really great. It was a really fun time for me in that theater company. That was a cool question. Thanks, man. Uh, this next question is from uh, Monique. 
Hi, Monique. This is for, for all of you. So uh, <clears throat> do you utilize substitution as part of your acting technique? Meaning, who's that, Monique? Meaning like, um, like, like if I'm talking to him, but I'm thinking about like talking to my real best friend in real life, do I use that in a scene? Yeah. Great yeah. question. Yeah, I, I, do, I do find that helpful because I think you, draw, you have to try to connect the characters that are in the film to characters that you've come across in real life and characters that you've met both in your personal world and your professional world and try to remember the way that you dealt with them and the way that they dealt with you. And uh, I do feel like it does help to add a, a little bit of salt and pepper because sometimes those interactions can be a little bit um, one note. So I think remembering those interactions, but also adding you know, your own flavoring and your own style to them has been something that's um, served me great and something that we worked on a lot on this particular project as well. What do you think? Sometimes that works. Uh, sometimes that's the thing that you need to, to think about to get you to the next level. Like, well, what would I really say? Well, what would I say if this was my dad? You know, like, and you'd really think of me like, oh, you know, I'd, oh, it'd give you a new idea and you do it. But sometimes it's also more important to not think about somebody from your past. To think about that person that's right there in the scene with you and tell this guy something because that's more immediate and real. So I think you mix them. You know, I want to ask, uh, you know, we were talking before. Uh, it's like one of my favorite movies of all time, you know, you, you gave yours. One of my more recent ones is, is La La Land. And I just got to ask, like, like, when did it hit you that that movie was going to be something really, really special. Um, so, uh, thank you. I appreciate that because it's a, a really important movie to me too, and um, I really enjoyed making it. And when I got the script, I just I saw it as this, you know, story of a, uh, you know, this 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 love story, and um, never knew how he was going to envision it at the end. And when we were shooting this one scene and I just had a small part in it and I was just shooting some driving stuff, but every day they had been going up to Griffith Park to shoot the dance sequence between the two of them. I don't know if everybody saw the movie, but there's a part where they're dancing in Griffith Park. And they would just go up every day at, at uh, Magic Hour to get, to get that dance sequence. And so right before I shot my thing, we were down at Hollywood Cemetery they were watching it back, what they had shot of the dance stuff. And they were like, Tom, come over here and check this out. See what we did today. And it was, gor it was just so gorgeous. It was just this wide shot on, from a crane of them doing that whole thing in just one. And it looked like an old time, you know, Fred Astaire or, you know, um, you know, beautiful Gene Kelly like dance sequence from an old movie. And I thought, oh my God, this is what this is gonna look like. Yeah, it's gonna look incredible. Uh, it was mind blowing. And it, it definitely is. And ladies and gentlemen, Danger One opens Friday, and it's on demand on Friday as well. So please make sure you I'll tell everyone to Hold see on. it. <laughs> tell, them I'm, tell them I'm busy. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us at today's SAG-AFTRA Foundation Q&A for Danger One. Thanks, fellas. Thank you.